on camera. Today is October 23rd, 2017. My name is Tony Hilliard. I'm a volunteer at the Atlanta History Center. And with me is Peggy Hilliard, another volunteer, and also Sue Verhoff, the Director of Oral History and Genealogy at the History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. We're here today to record the oral history of Charlotte Henry, who served in the U.S. Air Force during the Vietnam War. Ms. Henry's oral history is being recorded for the Library of Congress Veterans History Project. We're honored to have you with us today, Ms. Henry, and thank you for participating in the project. Uh, would you begin by telling us your full name and where you live? Yes, um, I'm Charlotte Henry and I live in Woodstock, Georgia. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit about your early years and growing up? Yeah, um, I was born at, um, at Crawford Long Hospital here in Atlanta. And um, when I was about a year old, my family moved to Marietta because my father um, in the, was in the you know, Army Air Corps and he was an aircraft mechanic. And so um, he got a job at Bell Bomber, okay. at the, you know, that later became Lockheed. And, um, and in that early, you know, Marietta was like a boom town in the, the late 40s and early 50s. And um, there was, such an influx of people to work at um, at Lockheed that um, they came up with, they had to do some really quick housing projects to um, make room, you know, make places for people to live. And um, so that was uh, how I wound up in Marietta and, um, you know, and then uh, and we lived in one of those those housing projects and I remember um, back when I was about three, uh, my earliest memories, my mother was a hairdresser and she, um, she had Tuesdays off and so um, she always wanted to go to Atlanta on Tuesday and she'd take me with her. Uh, we would take the Greyhound bus, you know, down, downtown. And back then, uh, you know, in the very early 1950s, if you went to Atlanta, you got dressed up. You know, it was just like you got you got dressed just as if you were going to church. You know, so it was uh, that was pretty cool. So um, then we moved out by Kennesaw Mountain. Uh, by the time I was um, in the eighth grade, and then. Um, I went to um, McEachern High School out in Powder Springs, and um, and I graduated in 1965. And of course, in 1965, it was um, the Vietnam War was was uh, was really, you know, uh, what was happening. Was and um, but uh, you know, the move was still kind of very. Um, positive, you know, for, you know, the conflict, except for um, uh, everybody who was, you know, had to be registered for the draft. And since I'm transgender and I was in the closet at the time, I registered for the, for the uh, draft. And um, it just so happened that one of my neighbors um, worked for the draft board, and she gave me a call and told me that that you know that, that this was before they had the lottery type thing, and so she called me and told me they were going to be uh, um, giving me my draft notice, and so I just got off the phone with her and went down to the Air Force recruiter and signed up in the Air Force. Um, mostly because my dad was okay. Army Air Corps, and so it's just kind of a family thing. So um, yeah, so I, I was I was very aware when I was little um, uh, of my gender dysphoria. Of course, you know I had no language for it, but um, uh, so when I went through my physical, you know they were asking. You know, if anybody was was homosexual, and it just didn't seem to apply to me because you know my gender issues were were not clear enough. I mean, they were uh, 
they were clear enough for me to know what was going on, but there just wasn't really enough uh, language to, right. yeah. to the word transgender had not been invented. And um, and so there was no, you could look in the encyclopedias and there was no kind of transgender, transvestite, transsexual, anything like that. And, um, you know, the T-R ended at Transvaal. And um, so anyway, so I wound up going in and um, um, I am um, just having to, keep my secret the whole time. And um, uh, I went through basic training at uh, Lackland Air Force Base. And then um, I got assigned to security police. And so um, I went through security police school. And there toward the end of the security police school, I got orders to go to Turkey. And I was so concerned that because I, I knew that I wasn't going to be able to keep my secret. It was just a matter of time. And so I felt like I would be safer in Vietnam than Turkey. When, when you were going through your training, were, were there any indications that, that there may have been other uh, members of the, the class who might be in the same no. situation you were? No. Everybody, it was a secret. Everybody oh, yeah, there, yeah, it's, it's like, uh, you know, I, I, I had a wall around me, and so it's, it's like, uh, yeah, there was no way I um, could, uh, could share that, you know, and, um, and it would have been devastating if I had, so, uh, and it turned out to be somewhat devastating when I did, um, but, yeah, so, um, the same day that I got my orders for um, for Turkey, um, everybody got called into this building to listen to some guy named, uh, this tech sergeant named uh, Cobb. Um, and um, so anyway, he came up and the first thing he said, there were 120 of us in the room. And he said, gentlemen, we have a shortage of dog handlers in Vietnam. And um, our barracks, when we were in, in security police school, was right next to the barracks for the people going through dog school. And so everybody knew that, that all the dog handlers were going straight to Vietnam. And so everybody was told, you know, it's like, whatever you do, and it's like, don't even talk to the dog handlers because they're all going to Vietnam and they're nuts and, and um, you know, there's, they're crazy, and um, and so I, I thought it was kind of funny, but um, but anyway, so it, he says there needs, you know, we need dog handlers, and so um, he asked if there were any volunteers, and I raised my hand because I'd seen a um, a war dog movie when I was a kid, and I thought it was just amazing. So um, after everybody else left i went to um i went to sergeant cobb and i said well you know i've i've got um i've got orders for turkey already and he said well you're going to have to make up your mind and i said well i don't have any trouble making up my mind i i don't want to do canine and he goes well you're going to be in vietnam within a year and i went that's better than turkey and, and you know and so and because i i felt like if if I got discovered in Turkey uh, outside of the military, I, I knew my life could be at risk for yes. that. So, um, um, so I went through dog school and uh, had the most amazing uh, experience in dog school. Went for a week of classes with uh, with a veterinarian before we ever got taken to the kennel. And we went into the kennel after a week of classes, and um, and there were 400 dogs there. And, of course, you know, some of them were already assigned and some of them weren't. And we're walking through this enormous kennel, and it just smells like dog poop. And I'm wondering if I'm going to be able to survive four years of, of that smell. 
And um, as we're walking through, you know, I'm looking at all these dogs, and all of a sudden there was this one dog. And I saw that dog, and I, I, it, I just caught my breath. And, I, and all of a sudden I was depressed because it's like there are 400 dogs here. There's no way that I'm getting that dog, and so no matter what dog they give me, I'm going to be disappointed. And so that was on a Friday afternoon, and so on Monday morning, we went back to the kennel when they assigned dogs to us, and that was my dog. And it was just, it, it was magical. And, um, and so my dog wouldn't let me in his kennel, and the kennels were completely covered in pea gravel. And so I noticed my dog was playing with a rock. He had dropped a rock in his water bucket, and then he'd stick his head in the water bucket and grab the rock out and throw it to the other side of his run and then go get it and bring it back, and, you know. So I just sat down and started throwing rocks at him, you know, and he decided that I was playing with him, and then all of a sudden his tail's wagging, and I went in on the dog, and we were um, we were fabulous. Uh, what you kind know, of a dog was it? German Shepherd. Okay. He was a uh, um, black and cream. Had a black saddle mark, and he looked just like Ren Tin Tin from the 1950s TV show. <laughs> Most beautiful dog I ever laid my eyes on, and he was so smart. And um, we went to um, we finished dog school and went to um, Homestead Air Force Base down in Florida. And, um, you know, I had no money. I was like, I was making like $90 a month. And it was taking half of that $90 to take care of my uniforms because I was in Strategic Air Command, which is like mega um, military. So it, it was crazy. So um, I spent all of my free time with my dog. So I was working with my dog, and I was relaxing with my dog. If I wasn't in my room, I was with my dog. Were you allowed to bring the dog to the room? No, no. Okay. no. And, um, you know, the, the sentry dogs were, um, at that time, um, they hadn't made a switch over uh, in the training process. The, 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 the mentality was in training was that the dog should bite on or off leash with or without command. So the dogs were just, you know, not um, not suitable for um, bringing to your room. So, um, so anyway, so I, I spent so much time with my dog that, that we could do more tricks than anybody else in the kennel. And so whenever we would have, you know, congressmen or senators come down, we'd put on a demo for them. It's like we would all do a demo and, and go through, you know, um, tricks and obedience and stuff. And then er everybody would kind of drop off as they ran out of stuff. And and um, and so Fritz and I were the last ones up always, just simply because, you know, I had nothing else to do. And I, I, there was nothing I wanted to do more than just spend time with them. So then... Um, <laughs> Somebody came up to me one day and said some orders just came in um, without a name on them for Tonsonet Air Base. And that uh, the guy said that he had been at Tonsonet and he said I should, I should go down there and put my name on it. So I did. I went down to a personnel and I said, I, I know there's orders for a dog handler to Tonsonet and I want it. And so. It didn't occur to me that I was going to be losing my dog, and so I, it's like I I didn't get to take Fritz with me. I I and, and that just I, I was devastated by that. But so um, I went home for a month, and then at the end of the month, I flew to um, flew to San Francisco, and then from San Francisco, I had to go to Edwards Air Force Base to uh, catch my flight to Vietnam, and sitting there. Um, and the terminal at Edwards, um, I'm sitting there and I'm looking around. Everybody's a, everybody's military, and so it's like there there's this one guy. He's just got his face buried in a Bible, you know. And it's like 
she was so freaked out with the thought of going to Vietnam. It's, it's like she's just so consumed with the fear of dying that it's like, you know, it, it just, you know, the Bible was the only thing that was keeping him going. And um, I remember feeling a little bit of contempt for him <laughs> over that. Um, so um, we all flew over on a uh, Braniff and um, on a Braniff airline. Can, can I ask you a question and take you back just a piece? Okay. Uh, you indicated that Fritz couldn't go with you. Was right. That, why was that? Because you had a complete training together? How, why was he not allowed to go with you? Do you know? That was just the way that they did it back then. That was just the way that it was. They already had the dogs there in Vietnam. So okay. so the dogs stayed and then the handlers rotated. Okay. And and, um, and so the dogs, you know, it's like Fritz went to Homestead. But Fritz didn't get he didn't get to go to Vietnam. He got to stay at Homestead. So the dogs had their own assignments. Yes, okay. right. So, um, yeah, so I went to, um, yeah, so I, I, I went to Vietnam on a, um, on a Braniff, and um, when I got out of the plane, when I was, as soon as I stepped out of the door, I'm on the top of the steps that, that, that they roll up to the plane, and I looked to my right, and there was a forklift, and, um, and as I think a C-141 um, or C-130, I think it's C-141. It was a big cargo plane, and they were loading um, caskets in it, and it was just unbelievably sobering. You know, I mean, it wasn't like there were 20 or 30 caskets. There were, you know, there were 100 caskets at least, and there were, you know, big aluminum caskets. When, and When was this? What? That was January 1st, 1968. Okay. One month before the Tet Offensive. And um, so I got in country, and um, uh, it, it's like it took them a couple of days to get me out to the kennel. And um, when I got there, there was there was kind of a general hostility, you know, from everybody. You know, it's it's like there was nobody that that warmed up to you, uh, you know, when you first got in Vietnam. And I, the you know, guy. and I didn't, yeah, I was a new person there, and so um, it was, you know, things were really hostile, and you had to go through some, some, uh, you know, you had to go through a couple of weeks of. of kind of uh, in-country training before they actually let you go out, you know, uh, on your own. And, uh, you know, as a dog handler, uh, an Air Force dog handler, we were sentry, uh, we were sentry dog handlers. And, um, and so we were only out at night. And, um, and so we would go to the kennel, you know, in the late afternoon when it was still light. And then we'd hang out and just do whatever until it started getting dark. And then we would then go out on patrol and everybody had a certain area that they had to cover. And uh, so we were primarily perimeter guards, but we had some compounds occasionally that we had to, usually like a weapons compound or, or a bomb dump or something like that that was a, a high risk, you know, thing, and so. Did you have a dog assigned to you? Yes, I did, yeah. As soon as I got to, got to Vietnam, I, How was that dog? I, he was great, he was great. It, it's, it's funny though, somebody really needed to be beaten because somebody named a German Shepherd George, you know? So my dog's name was George. I mean, so it's like when you're doing a track attack training, you know, and, and you're getting ready to turn your dog loose on, you know, a guy in a, in a taxi. You're just going, get him, George. <laughs> so I thought that was hilarious, and um, yeah, it was, it was kind of a, yeah, it's like whoever did that, oh, 
George. But he was a um, he was a beautiful dog, and he was a perfect size. He weighed seventy two pounds, and um, he was he was awesome. He uh, he was terrific, and um, and so we we got along splendidly until we got out. Um, Got out on post and started th things started happening. And it's, it's like um, if uh, if my dog picked up a scent of, of somebody, um, George wanted to stand on his hind legs and and bark, you know. So it, it's like and when we would be getting mortars or rocket attacks, he would agitate, you know. So he would be you know wanting to bite somebody or something. Um, if there were any explosions going on, and you can hear rockets and mortars coming in, and so it's like the closer that they land to you, the louder they are coming in. And so George would agitate on just on the roar of you know the incoming rounds, and so um, you know um, we had a. a Real close encounter with a 122 millimeter, 122 millimeter rocket one night that landed about, um, I guess, about 10 or 12 yards, you know, from us, and so it was coming in. It sounded like a freight train, and so I, you know, I jumped down, you know, in a ditch, and um, it wasn't much of a ditch, but it was enough. And George is just jumping around, and I'm trying to grab him and pull him down, and I, he was just n n not cooperating at all. So I took my helmet off and I smacked him just to get his attention, you know, and then grabbed him and laid down on him. And it's all happened in just a, almost no time at all. And um, yeah, and so it, uh, you know, it, that 122 came in, and it was, it was quite impressive. Um, but uh, we got a lot. They uh, after the after we got hit in Tet, um, there was uh, there was a lot of um, we had a lot of days consecutively where we. It seems like it must have been two months where we got we we were taking mortars and rockets did, every day. Did you ever experience any ground threats? I mean, did you walk the wire? Yeah, and um, yeah, one night. Um, uh, Highway one ran real close to um, real close to um, Tonsonet Air Base, and it was weird how the uh, how Tet happened at at, uh, at Tonsonet. Um, there had been fire coming from one end of the base. There was tracer rounds being shot, you know, across the base all evening, but just sporadic, and. Um, so everybody spends their time looking over here. Well, then down here at the 051 gate on the other side of the base, well, as a, a Freedom Bird, you know, starts taking off, it's like VC and North Vietnamese regulars start coming out of tunnels. Um, and so they swarm the, um, the 051 and the 055 gate and um, so we had, uh, if memory serves me correctly, there were like three battalions of Viet Cong and five battalions of North Vietnamese or vice versa. And um, so um, luckily we had a heliport and um, uh, we were getting hit so hard that, um, that um, they, um, airdropped in some uh, 25th Infantry um, to help us out, and so I was on the um, I was on the north perimeter, um, standing at the edge of a minefield right at the perimeter, and um, just outside the on the other side of the minefield was uh, it, you know it was jungle, and um, and so. Uh, all of a sudden, this the, the firefight breaks out, and it's I mean, it, and it's close, and, and I'm so close to the firefight that I can't see tracers, you know. I, I can see white, I can't see red can't see or green, 
you know, so I don't know who is who. And so I'm, you know, I'm standing there, you know, like a spectator, and I'm thinking, I don't know what to do. I mean, I certainly can't go through the minefield, you know. So um, I didn't realize it, but there was a, a helicopter directly on top of me in silent mode, and, and he started firing um, anti-personnel rockets. And the thing is that the rockets would explode, and then I would hear them travel. You know, they were so fast, it was like it'd go boom, shh, you know, and uh, so um, all of a sudden that firefight was over, and then I looked down. And there was another firefight going on, you know, probably a quarter of a mile away, and there was a helicopter down there, and I could see tracers coming from the helicopter down to the ground, and then. Um, the helicopter got shot down, and so it just did a spiral and, and, and crashed, and it was just kind of uh, an unreal kind of thing. But it's, I hadn't really recovered from seeing that big sack of caskets, you know, when I was getting off the plane. So your, my mind was just really functioning more like a... Um, like I was in a movie, you know. It's like, it's it, yeah, it wasn't. Uh, yeah, I, it's like when rockets would come in. If you know, because you can hear if they're going to be close or not. It's like if they're not going to be close, then I want to. I want to see what's going on. So I'm looking for them. I'll climb up on something and, and just so I can see the the uh, big orange. Uh, How long have you been in country at this time? Um, a little over a month. Okay. Yeah, because so um, yeah, I was in I was in country one month when when Tet Tet started. So um, so then um, yeah, so uh, it it's it just stayed. You know, there there was we were. We were able to get past the, the first couple of days, and, and um, uh, you know we had 82nd Airborne there in 25th and 25th Infantry, and then you know it's like we uh, my unit was the uh, 377th Sentry Dog or Security Police Squadron Sentry Dog Section, and um, and so. Um, it was the same unit that uh, the dog Nemo w was um, was in. In 1965, there was a um, there, there was an infiltration uh, uh, into um, into Tonsonet by a sapper squad that came in through a, a, an irrigation ditch, and um, and so Nemo was one of the dogs at, at the kennel, and uh, Nemo got got shot in the face and. Uh, and even after being shot in the face, Nemo um, killed the guy that shot him. So um, Nemo was a good dog, and he got retired from uh, from combat duty after that. He, he was yeah. They used him to go around and try and um, get people to donate dogs to the uh, Vietnam effort, and uh, so Nemo was was pretty good. So um, yeah. So then. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm like 20, and oh, my gender issues were just beating me to death, and um, and um, I, I, you know, I was normal in pretty much any other way, I, I suppose, <laughs> which is kind of a ridiculous thing to say, I guess, but um, you know, I, there was this. This place called uh, 100 P Alley, and uh, 100 P Alley was uh, like a, a red light district, and it was you know where prostitutes were, and um, and uh, so I went down to 100 P Alley, and I got a prostitute, and and um, and. Something about her just hit me. She wasn't particularly pretty, and 
something just you know and, and I needed companionship you know I was needing I, I was needing something else you know and so I just you know something about her I looked at her as a human and not as a prostitute and so rather than trying to get pleasure myself I tried to comfort her for what she was having to live through and how she was having to live her life and um, because I just held her and gave her some um, compassion we became friends and um, so she was the first person I came out to and she helped me buy my first dress so I bought my first dress in Vietnam and I, I was um, <laughs> Telling a friend of mine about uh, you know about you know that that you know it's just kind of unusual you know it's like being transgender you know being transgendered and buying your first dress you know in a combat zone that's that's a little over the top so um, so my friend <laughs> my friend says so uh, you went to Vietnam for the shopping and I went. Uh, yeah, I never thought about it like that, but I guess so. So, um, yeah, and, and she took me to her apartment and, you know, and let me, you know, put my dress on. And she had a balcony. She lived on the second floor of a two-story building. She had a balcony, and so it's like, you know, I didn't want to dress up and hide, you know. It's like I, was, I didn't want to just wear a dress I wanted to be a girl you know so when I put that dress on it's like that balcony I, it's like I wanted to step out on the balcony and so I did and she just lunged at me and grabbed me and pulled me back inside you know it's like and when she did that I, I went I was like what was I thinking you know so um so, uh, yeah, so it was, um, it was something, by the time I had, um, uh, I got to Vietnam January 1st, and by early November, I was pretty unhinged. Um, I was, I, I was nuts, and in, in K-9, um, there was, like a, there was a special kind of camaraderie in K9, and it was that it, it doesn't matter if you liked the other dog handler or not, you always had his back. You never let anything happen to another dog handler, and so everybody knew that I was fried. I mean, I was I was toast, and so you know it's like my NCOIC. You know, and all the other dog handlers, they just, they took care of me. They knew how dysfunctional I was, and uh, they kept me from, they kept me from getting in trouble, and um, it was amazing, and I, I wasn't nice, and I was pretty dangerous, and so they were putting me places where I couldn't so, get into trouble. So the, the stress of, number one, being in... Vietnam and and being these, trans in Vietnam is yeah. was just yeah. yeah, ten months of that and and I was pretty toasted, and, and plus I was in the hospital twice once uh, once for acute bronchitis and then the second time with pneumonia, and um, so did the uh, other dog handlers know why you were fried? Did did they know why it was so tough for you? No. They just knew that you were. They just knew that I, I I couldn't function anymore, gotcha. you know. And and they they knew me before I fell apart, so they knew it wasn't something that I had control of. So um um I, I was able to uh, get out of Vietnam and um, I came back. And um, I, I got stationed at um, Eglin, and when I got to Eglin, there was no room for a dog handler at that point. So I got put on 
uh, regular security police, and so sometimes I would be, um, you know, at one of the main gates, you know, and waving traffic through, and sometimes I would be out on the flight line with, the, you know, an airplane. And um, I also got to guard the, um, that SR-71 or 70, no, whatever it was, yeah, I, yeah. I stood guard on that plane. And, uh, and that was really pretty interesting. And then, uh, around June of 69, an opening came in the canine section. So I'd been been there then since uh, I'd been there since around February. It took until June for an opening to to come available at uh, at the kennel. And so I, in June I get to go be in canine again, and um, and so um, from. February when I got to Eglin until um, un un until I left there, um, I, I had a sleep disorder and I couldn't wake up. If I went to sleep, I couldn't wake up and people couldn't wake me up. And so I was always late um, for every place I was supposed to be. and. Um, and I was in trouble all the time. And I never had a day off because I was always having to work my days off as punishment for being late all the time. And um, and so um, I was just, I wanted, I, it was, I was so miserable that I, I volunteered, I, I, I went to personnel and tried to go back to Vietnam and they wouldn't let me go back to Vietnam. and. I had no idea what to do, and so um, in August I um, went down to the base hospital and I uh, made an appointment with the uh, psychiatrist, and um, um, I made an appointment with the psychiatrist, and uh, and I had to. Um, How long had you been in the Air Force at this time? How many years had you been in? Two years and. Two years and eight months at on, this point. How long an enlistment? Three, four years. Four. Four years. Okay. Yeah, and so, um, so um, I, you know, I got get an appointment with this uh, um, psychiatrist there at the base hospital at Eglin, and um, and so I was so petrified. You know, and, and at the time, you know, I was raised as a Southern Baptist, and so, you know, it's like, I, I, I just, I thought, surely this is something that, you know, it's like, there's, if there's not a pill for it, there's some treatment or something. So I go in and I am telling this psychiatrist about all the trouble that I'm having with my sleep and, um, and how I just, I'm, Things are not working out, and I told him as well as I could about my uh, gender issues, and uh, and he was very kind, and um, so um, I got a a, a medical discharge uh, um, because of my uh, anxiety disorder, and and. Um, uh, so, um, so, so you did about three years. Yeah. How quickly did you get your medical discharge? I mean, did well, you... uh, that was it was in August, and he relieved me of duty that very day. That okay. you know, so I never went after when I left his office. I never went back to the kennel. Okay. So uh, it's like um, they processed me out of the base. And then I went home pending discharge, and so I was I was home in August, but my discharge didn't take place until late October. So my actual time in service was two years, ten months, and twenty two days. And um, and so so I I come back and it's. Um, you know, it's uh, late 1969, and um, you know, I had um, 
I had gotten involved in uh, martial arts back in in the in, in the 1964, you know, mostly just to protect myself because, you know, I was fearful, you know. Um, I wasn't, no, I, you know, I wasn't terribly masculine, <laughs> you know, to begin with. So, um, you know, I just didn't have that kind of male. Right. You know, yeah. So, um, um, yeah, so I had a, um, you know, I had done that, and, um, and another thing that I did when I was in Vietnam is I hooked up with some Koreans, uh, the Korean Army, and, and I trained with the Koreans in uh, Taekwondo. They were there teaching the Vietnamese military, and so um, they... Um, I, I saw them teaching at the um, at the uh, at the Air Force compound, and I got off the truck um, that was taking us back to our barracks one morning, and just so I could could watch. And so at the end of their class, I asked the you know the Koreans there if they would teach me, and they said no. And so I went, oh, okay. So I was okay with that, but every morning. I would get them to let me off, and I would just go watch class. And so I had been watching class like for over a week, you know. And all of a sudden, they they got you know done with their class, and they put their fatigues back on, and got in a jeep. And then they told me to get in the jeep with them. Now I went, oh great, they're going to give me a a ride back, so I don't have to walk all the way back to the you know. To the uh, compound where I, uh, uh, my barracks are, and so they took me to their compound, which I, um, fortunately was very, very close to mine. And they asked me what I did, and I told them. And they asked me um, uh, if if I could show up, you know, in the morning for a class and in the afternoon for a class. And so they gave me private lessons twice a day, six days a week, and just beat me to death, you know, the whole time. And um, so when I came back, you know, I, I, between what I'd done before I went in the service, and you know, I, I came back, you know, I, I had my black belt, and um, and in 1972, I was the Georgia State Black Belt Champion. And um, it's still in the closet. But then about three months after I won the Georgia State title, um, I decided I needed to go shopping. And so I, I went shopping as Charlotte, you know, and, um, and on my way home, um, it was a three-way intersection, and I had a stop sign, but it was so easy to see that I didn't come to a complete stop. And so I got pulled over by a policeman, and I give him my driver's license. And the next thing I know, um, there's a you know there's there's a van that comes up, and four other police cars, and um, and I get uh, my car gets impounded, and I got arrested for impersonating a female and um, and then um, I, they took me to the Atlanta police station and um, I was strip searched in front of um, at least a dozen male and female officers and then they after I was finished being booked they paraded me around every floor in the jail so everybody could have a good look. And then um, after, you know, they got, got through with their little show, they uh, took me to, um, to my particular floor, whatever it was, and, and um, they I, somehow or other, I, I don't remember exactly how I did it, but I, I wound up getting uh, bail so I could get out. 
and uh, I had to get a taxi home. And um, so I got uh, I got a lawyer, you know, and the lawyer wanted me to um, to sue the city of Atlanta for violation of my civil rights because, for one thing, there was no law. You know, I, 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 there was no law that I had actually broken, other than than not coming to a complete stop. At so so your time. car was impounded. My car was impounded. Yeah, I, I just it didn't. It wasn't even a. As a matter of fact, I never got a ticket for running the stop sign, I, and um, and it wasn't really a, a running the stop right. sign. It was just it was a rolling right. stop, you know, and um, so. So yeah, so I, I I get out, you know, and and he's talking about a, you know a civil rights trial, and, and I'm thinking, when I was in Vietnam, my mother had sent me a, the a clipping from the Marietta Journal. There was a doctor in Marietta who had gotten arrested for being cross-dressed in public, and it made the front page of the Marietta Journal. You know, and my mom knew. You know, it's like there aren't secrets in families, and and so she sends me this. And so all I can think of is that I'm, you know, this just this is just too juicy. You know, it's like martial arts and this, and it would just be too newsworthy. And I just went, no, I I can't. Yeah. So I, I just I, was, I knew I couldn't deal with it, so I just pled no low, and um, and so then um, I, you know, stayed in the closet, and somehow I got through that uh, that arrest, and and um, I was uh, I was the number two rated um, karate fighter in the southeast. Uh, by a professional karate magazine, and and um, I was chief instructor for the Joe Corley Studios here in town, and, um, and so I was one of my jobs was that you know I, I taught all the instructor classes, so my, all the teachers had to take class under me, and and I was brutal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had those Koreans in right. Vietnam, and they really tainted me, you know. But um, but yeah, so I you know, I, I, I was easily the most physical teacher in Atlanta, and um, and so um, I, that was always an important thing to me, just because it was, just because it was. I was naturally good at it, and. Um, um, I was more pretty at it than anything else. His style. I had um, I had the right body type to make it look good, and so um, uh, I was always, you know, the star student in class and that kind of thing. And so, um, yeah, that was a. So in, by 1975, I had gotten a um, a job offer to teach in upstate New York, and um, so I went to New York. And after I get to New York, I go, wait a minute, Christine Jorgensen's doctor was in New York City. Her doctor was Harry Benjamin. So. Uh, you know, I get a New York City phone book, and I'm looking through it, and I find a Harry Benjamin clinic. And so I wrote them a letter, and they wrote me back, and they made a special appointment for me on a Saturday to meet me. And I went to the Harry Benjamin clinic and, um, and started on hormones in 1975. And... Um, so did you move? Did you take the position in New York? Or? Oh yeah, that, I was okay. living in New York. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I was teaching in the uh, capital area in in um, in Albany, okay. and um, so actually I taught at two different schools: one in Albany and one in Schenectady, and um, and so. Yeah, so I, I I got on hormones there, and then a um, couple of years I was homesick for Atlanta, so I moved back, 
And when I got back here, there was no, um, there was no, um, I, I didn't know a doctor that I could get my, my prescription for anymore. So I'm calling everybody in town I can think of. And so I'll, what I'm doing is I'm looking through the phone book, calling every OBGYN, you know. And, and so one of them tells me that there's a research program going on at Georgia Mental Health. And so I went over and I got um, enrolled in that research program where they were, uh, they had um, trans people and they were giving them hormones and placebos in, in a double blind study and trying to find out whether or not it was an efficacious treatment, you know. So um, the payoff was is that, uh, you know, if you went through this, uh, they were going to um, it, it, they were going to be your doctor, and they, you could get your prescription from them afterwards. And so, yeah, so for two years, I went every two weeks, and um, they'd give me a shot and give me a bottle of pills, and then I'd come back, and I would have to be interviewed by um, by a couple of um, uh, social workers, and I had to do written um, personality profile tests, and see a nurse and, you know, and get my next shot and batch of pills. And sometimes I got estrogen at this level, sometimes it was this level, and sometimes it was a placebo. And so at the end of two years, um, they said that I, you know, was more functional on, um, uh, you know, on estrogen and, and uh, when they gave me uh, you know, a higher level of estrogen, you know, my personality, my psychological profile, you know, got more normal. And, um, and so, um, yeah, so that was, that was pretty much the end of my martial arts uh, uh, career, you know, was, you, you know, with the estrogen, you, you don't, you know, the, the contact actually hurts a lot more than it did, used did it to. Did it do anything to your strength? Yeah, but I wasn't worried about that. Uh, it's, it's like, um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's like, I, I didn't value my strength except in competition. So, but, but then, yeah, as I was training, you know, it's just like it, you know, your body responds to that and puts out more testosterone, and so and that's just taking me in a direction that I'm not comfortable with, and so it didn't. You know, it, it, it's like the the harder I trained, the worse I got mentally, and so um, yeah, and so um, and then I got to. Um, uh, you know, I, I went for a couple of years, and I was, uh, I, I got pretty lonely, um, and, um, I, I, and I found out, you know, um, when you're trans, even if you're not living full-time as, as, um, as the gender you wish you were, um, that, um, People would be attracted to you, but they would be embarrassed by you at the same time. So I would be in relationships with people that would that would wind up saying, "You know, I really love you, but you know, there's just no way I can let my family know that I'm I'm involved with you." And so I uh, wind up in a, in a a relationship that turns um um really abusive and um, I, I got um, I got pressured um, out of um, out of taking hormones and, um, and you know, luckily I guess luckily I, I was in a wreck and um, I was in intensive care for about six weeks and so my face was really messed up, and uh, so 
I had to have a lot of reconstructive surgery. And um, my, uh, my relationship was able to, you know, conceive a child uh, during that, that recovery time. Uh, it took me a couple of years really to get over that wreck. And uh, so this is like 1986 and I wound up with a daughter and my daughter is just like the, the light of my life. She's the one thing that has just been miraculous. But, um, you know, the trans thing is always there. You know, I had gotten rid of any facial hair, you know, you know, long before that. So it didn't matter, you know, that I was going in some place, you know, wearing a, a T-shirt and jeans. I was still getting called ma'am. You know, and you know, and and yet, you know, I'm trying to trying to come off as a guy, and I'm I'm coming off as a as a um, you know as a woman trying to come across as a man. So, um, I I just it got to the point where I, I was like I was so disappointed in myself that I had kind of regressed back into the closet that I I got suicidal. And um, and I, um, I I felt like I had let myself down so much that um, I I just wanted to die, and um, so I found a doctor here in town, and I uh, she was an endocrinologist, and um, and so I um. I, I, and my first appointment with her, I just broke down into tears, and um, she hugged me. And I was so starved for physical touch. I couldn't believe, you know, because I just, I hadn't been touched in so long. And um, so I, um, I got back on hormones with her, and, um, and then um, I, I, you know, I was going to try and go that way because, you know, when I came back from Vietnam, I, I, I went down to the VA hospital and right after I got arrested, you know, I had a th therapist, you know, that was wanting me to go through aversion therapy where they wanted me to come in and bring clothes and then I would take, I, I would get dressed and they would take pictures of me while I'm getting dressed and then they would play those pictures back for me and they would induce vomiting while I would be washing th those pictures of me getting dressed and so that when they made that suggestion to me I stormed out and I didn't go back to the VA for a long time after that and um, and so um, the VA's come a long way. They are really, in spite of that bad situation, um, I, I, if it wasn't for the VA, I wouldn't be here today. They really saved me. And um, so I, I, I can't say enough about how much they've helped me in spite of a few bad things that have happened. So the, this is aversion, aversion therapy was yeah. in the 80s? No, that's in 1972. That was okay. that was right after I got arrested. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And um, and so. Um, yeah. So. Um, Not a happy time. No. Well, and it never is. It's just a matter of you know, kind of going through a cycle, you know. Um, it's like once I had my, once I, I guess it's kind of like, you know, the way they say if you suffer sunstroke or, you know, heat exhaustion, that it makes it easier for you to have it again. Uh, it's uh, kind of, you know, it's like a, 
the meltdown that I had at the end of my tour in Vietnam and, and until I got got to discharge I, I, I periodically go through that and um, and so I'm just coming off of a, a um, uh, depressive episode I, I hope I'm coming off of it now but um, yeah so I'm um, um, you know, right now I work on pianos, and um, so I have a very small world. And um, um, as much as I'm telling you here, n nobody that I work with really knows anything about my private life. So, you know, I'm pretty much a uh, mystery to most people. Well, I appreciate your frankness with us. Uh, at the very end, we like to give the interviewee an opportunity to just editorialize about whatever you'd like to talk about, any comments about uh, uh, anything, your service. Uh, you don't have to. Yeah, I, I don't know that I would have anything to editorialize. Um, it's just, uh, you know, I, I think, um, you know, I, I think, you know, being transgender has, has, has really um, had one really profound um, benefit for me, and that is um, it made it crystal clear how completely full of shit most people are about their opinions about, you know, anyone who is gay or lesbian or transgender and thinking that that it's a choice. It's like I was 11 years old when my depression started um, because when I was smaller than that, I was just, you know, I was playing dress up and playing with my mother's makeup and, and jewelry and wearing her shoes and stuff. And, you know, when you're small enough, you just do it and it's just fun. But then by the time you're about 10 or 11, all of a sudden it'll hit you and you realize what your social status is going to be. And, um, and it just devastated me. I, I didn't, I, I knew I was going to be a pariah. And it's like, nobody wants that. And um, uh, so, you know, it's like growing up in the Southern Baptist Church, you know, it's like God will fix anything. You know, uh, you know, it's like, yeah, right, yeah. It, it, over the course of your life, have you seen any change in the culture toward transgender? It was great when we were off the radar. And um, and so now things are rolling back. I'm surprised at how far things have come, but then after Caitlyn Jenner came out, you know, it's like all of a sudden now everybody knows what transgender is, kind of. But so many people, you know, think that they can think about it for 15 minutes and then they have an opinion about it. You know, it's like, oh, I can think about, you know, leukemia for 15 minutes, but my opinion's not really worth anything. So these people, you know, I, I see people on podcasts and on, you know, talking about, oh, well, you know, trans people are like this and this, and it's like, 40% suicide rate, so, you know, it doesn't matter whether they transition or not, and it's like, no, wait a minute, you know, it's not that simple, that's just anecdotal, um, you know, get a transgender child and let them grow up and be who they are and be treated like everybody else, and I don't think you're going to have a suicide rate that's going to be any different than the rest of the population. But when you are so shunned, um, you know, an, an important 
thing that happened in my life that was, you know, really traumatic, and I didn't really realize how much damage it it caused um, until a little over a year ago. Um, was uh, I woke up when I was uh, about nine years old, I guess. I woke up one Saturday morning, and my dad said, "Come on, you need to get dressed." And I said, "Okay." So I got my clothes on and got in the car with him. And he takes me to Little League tryouts. Well, I hadn't, you know, I had nothing. You know, I had no idea that's what we were going to do. So anyway, so they're lobbing balls at you. And so I hit hit the ball twice, you know, and fly balls. And I didn't think it was anything spectacular. But they wound up putting me on a team. So then my parents uh, come to my first game. And I'm kind of intimidated by the lights, you know, because it's at night and there's bleachers there and there's, you know, a bunch of people and stuff. So I go up to bat three times and strike out all three times. And my parents never, ever went to see me do anything else after that. That was the last time they ever went to see me do anything. And um, and so... Um, um, I, I was on Today in Georgia with Ruth Kent, you know, one time. They didn't even turn the TV on, you know, to see that. And um, so it was, uh, you know, it's like I had embarrassed them because I was a feminine boy. And um, so it, it's like it was painful for them. and And I just glossed over that and so then you know it's about a year ago uh, I was in therapy and I had to confront that really for the first time and it was it was amazingly devastating you know even after 60 years you know it's because you just turn off and you you know I wasn't old enough to process it so um, when I saw you know because you you realize, you know, very early on that, you know, it's like if parents have a little girl and their little girl's a tomboy, well, that that's bragging rights. Right. But if you have a little boy and, and the boy is feminine or a sissy, then um, that's there's, there's nothing to brag about there. That's that's uh, that's you know shaming territory and. Um, you know, and I uh, even got to, got called a sissy by my fourth grade teacher in front of the class. And so it was just, you know, it was an ongoing thing for me. Um, but uh, here I am. Do you have any questions? How pia why piano? How did piano come into your life? <laughs> my nephew is a Steinway artist. He is a, uh, he's a classical pianist. He is the... Uh, he was the co-conductor for the Atlanta Boys Choir. Uh, Fletcher Wolf has been, has stepped down from, and so now my nephew is going to be the new conductor for the Atlanta Boys Choir, and he's on the faculty at Kennesaw State. And um, he won more international piano competitions than anyone in history. So. Um, my nephew, being a Steinway artist, I got introduced to uh, someone from the Steinway dealer here in town um, when uh, he had won one of his um, competitions that I was able to attend. And, um, and so I was doing furniture repair at the time. And so when I told this person I did furniture repair, they said, oh, can you please come by the store? And so I went by the the um, Steinway dealer, you know, a couple of weeks after that, and they asked me to do a repair on a bald one. And um, they liked the repair, so then the next day I was doing a service call for them, and a month later I was an employee. So, you know, it was, uh, it, it was a, a great move, and it was actually the first really good job I ever had. Good. Yeah. Peg, did you have anything? Good? Charlotte, thank you for sharing with us. Uh, 
we appreciate your telling your story. We also appreciate your service. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming in today. Thank you. A lot.